All right, everyone, that's getting started. All right, welcome to the centennial session on Earth's observation capabilities and future needs. Um, so we have a variety of talks on Earth's observation capabilities and user needs, data and architecture and, and uh, applications. So each speaker has eight minutes and then we'll hopefully we'll leave some time for questions. So let's start with um, Emily Silak glassman from Stippy talking about identifying Federal Earth observations uh, interdependencies using results of 2016 EOA. Perfect, thank you. Great. Uh, well, thanks so much uh, to the organizers for having me. It's a real pleasure to get to speak to you today. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some results and analysis that we've done from the 2016 National Earth Observation Assessment. This is work. It's not just mine. It draws on a, a whole team of our work, um, including Jason Gallo, who's here today, and Saul Vitkin. So uh, the origin of this work comes from the 2010 NASA Authorization Act, which directed the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to establish a mechanism to coordinate Earth observations across the many federal agencies that are involved in its collection and use. So the goals of the recent uh, National Earth Observation, which occurred between 2014 and 2016, were to quantify the reliance of the federal government on individual Earth observations, regardless of their source, so they could be federal observations, state, local, citizen science, et cetera, to assess the impact of those observations on the provision of societal benefit, to look at the unanticipated applications of those observations beyond those uh, for which they might have originally been intended, and in general to provide an evidence-based reference for informing decisions across the federal government and to inform the development of the second national, national plan for civil earth observations, which is currently in development. The approach that we use, which is shared with um, NOAA and USGS, is to use a value tree assessment approach. So the value tree allows us to link societal benefit areas at the very top, down through objectives to key products, services, and research outcomes, and finally to the Earth observation inputs at the very bottom of the tree. And on the right, I'm showing an example of that, which I won't get into, um, but just to say that we had um, 13 different societal benefit areas that we developed trees for. We ended up with 217 key objectives, which were defined by teams of federal scientists and program managers. We did uh, approximately 3,000 elicitation interviews to gather information about over 1,700 unique Earth observation products, services, and research outcomes, and ultimately we got a list of 1,323 total Earth observation inputs. So when we did these elicitations with experts, we went to each of, the, each of the providers of key products, services, and research outcomes and asked them to identify what all their inputs were and to quantify both their reliance on that data source and the performance of the data source. So we took all of that information and we basically built it into a network. So I'm showing a cartoon of it here. And what I'd like to point out is that it's tree-like on the top and web-like on the bottom. That if we consider a single Earth observation input at this very bottom of the value tree, it might feed into multiple intermediate products, which in turn feed into multiple key product services and outcomes. And then we can look at how the, that, um, that input then impacts other levels of the value tree. So in reality, our network had 53,000 nodes, a little bit more actually. So you can't just look at a network like that and get insight. You need a way to access that information in a smart way. So our colleagues over at Stippy built uh, the EOA Explorer, which really allows us to interrogate that network. So I'm showing a snapshot of the tool here. One of the things we were asked to do was to look at how does the National Agricultural Imagery Program, this is aerial imagery that's been collected uh, by USDA uh, since the 30s, what products does that feed into? So we noticed it feeds into the National Marine Sanctuary Condition Reports. So it's a NOAA product, not necessarily obvious how USDA aerial imagery might feed into a NOAA product. So we generate a visualization here showing um, National Agricultural Imagery Program on the bottom, going into the National Marine Sanctuary Conditions on, um, reports on the top, and we can 
trace out that pathway through a wetlands inventory, a forest inventory, FEMA floodplain maps, USDA products, EPA products, a USGS water quality program, up to Office of Coastal Resource Management water quality reports. So this is a not necessarily obvious chain. It has a lot of intermediary steps, but shows how one agency might uh, depend highly on another without the original agency knowing how that product is used. Um, so here's another example. We were looking at Landsat, and we were interested to see that Landsat and operational satellite feeds into the NASA experimental and research measurements. So one pathway is through state soil, uh, state soil surveys, which go into a drought monitor by NASA, which goes into a drought severity index by NCAR, and then into NASA research. Another is through wetland inventories, which go into land cover databases, which go into floodplain maps, and then on up. So another example we looked at is how the U.S. depends on an international research asset. So the European Space Agency, ESA, launched three swarm satellites to understand the Earth's magnetic field in 2013, and they've also been used to study the impact of solar storms. We found in looking at our value tree that we could also see the use of swarm by, um, by our reference measurements societal benefit area in which it was used um, for uh, the geopotential reference frame, and then in space weather uh, for geomagnetic field research and improved forecasting research. Now, this poses an interesting question because the, while the mission's been extended to 2021, there are no follow-on missions currently planned. So we can take a look at this and bring this up with decision makers and say, we see that this is in use. It's in use mostly in research. Is this something that the U.S. would like to continue uh, working on? And if so, what's the plan for getting this kind of data in the future? Um, similarly, here's a much more complicated product, um, looking at the U.S. Global Forecast System model, um, colloquially known as the National Weather Model. So I'm showing the Global Forecast System model on the right, and I have intermediate products here. And on the left, I have all of the different inputs, and I've pulled out the international inputs on the right. We've got inputs, uh, many shared through uh, WMO40 from different nations. We've got UMETSAT observations, Canadian observations, Japanese observations, all being ingested through international data sharing agreements into our operational weather model. So uh, with that, I just hope that uh, the demonstration of the EOA Explorer has shown how we can identify non-obvious relationships between agencies and reliance on international assets. We can further use the Explorer to identify other issues of interest, including co-occurrence of data sources, highly connected nodes, and other different types of dependencies. And with this Explorer tool, we hope to be able to answer many policy-relevant questions and help in coordinating the Earth observation system across the federal government. Thanks. We have time for one quick question, if anybody has a question. Okay. All right, you explain everything perfectly. Thanks. Okay. Our next, oh, our next speaker is Yusuke um, Kuwayama from Resource uh, for the Future, talking about quantifying the socioeconomic benefits of satellite data applications at different decision-making scales. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the organizers for convening the session and for inviting me to speak. Um, my name is Yusuke Kawayama. I'm an economist at Resources for the Future, which is a uh, think tank based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are a bunch of economists who conduct analysis of a variety of environmental and natural resource issues, and one of our projects is a cooperative agreement with NASA uh, to advance the science um, and uh, understanding within the earth science community about the value of um, earth science uh, information. And so what I want to do today is to uh, talk about the approach that the consortium, um, this cooperative agreement with NASA, takes in quantifying the value of satellite data applications and specific decisions. Okay, and it is um, you know, very different from the approach that uh, Emily just discussed, which you know, tries to cover a very broad set of uh, data sources and uses. Um, our approach focuses on very specific uh, data products or information systems or decision support tools and uh, a specific decision context within which they're used. Okay? And I wanted to give you examples 
uh, across four different uh, decision-making scales at the federal level, at the state level, and the private sector, and at the individual level. Okay, so just a very quick description of uh, what we mean by uh, quantifying um, the value of earth science in decisions. We do so through what we call impact assessments. These impact assessments are rigorous quantitative studies that investigate how people use improved information to make decisions. So we document what, how the information is used in a decision, and then we also quantify how those decisions improve socioeconomically meaningful outcomes. And in order to do that, we use something called the value of information method. And uh, there's a lot behind this method, but the bottom line is that it involves a comparison of two worlds. Okay, one world in which a decision is made in the absence of the information that you're trying to assess, and you try to identify what the socioeconomically meaningful outcomes are in that world, and then you can look at the alter alternate world in which uh, this information that you're trying to assess is available and is used in this decision and can potentially lead to a different outcome uh, that is socioeconomically meaningful. Okay? So we are always comparing uh, the outcomes in these two worlds, the value of those outcomes to society, the difference in the value of those outcomes to society uh, defines the value of the information. So diving right into uh, what these impact assessments look like. Here is my example of the use of satellite information in a federal agency decision. Um, this is one of the studies that has been completed as part of the Valuables Consortium. Uh, this is the cooperative agreement with NASA that RFF uh, is currently engaged in. Um, and the question, uh, the decision that uh, is being assessed here is um, the enforcement of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Okay, so this is uh, uh, with an EPA. Uh, and the question that uh, my colleagues at RFF, Daniel Sullivan and Alan Krupnik, addressed was, what are the socioeconomic benefits of using satellite data in order to enforce uh, these air quality standards as opposed to ground-based monitors, which is what currently takes place? And so the, the authors of the study used uh, MODIS data uh, on uh, particulate matter, so MODIS derived data on particulate matter, um, to identify which counties in the United States have been misclassified as being in attainment of federal air quality standards using these ground-based air quality monitors. Okay, and they use satellite data in order to, to figure out what these misclassified counties are. And they run the scenario in which these counties uh, actually need to reduce uh, air pollution within their county uh, because they are actually not in attainment of federal air quality standards. And what they find is that uh, over 24 million Americans are currently living in counties that do not meet these federal standards, um, uh, though currently they are thought to be living in uh, counties that have sufficiently clean air based on the ground-based quality monitors. And if these counties did uh, reduce air pollution within their counties, then that would lead to uh, about 5,500 uh, avoided premature deaths over the course of two years. Um, and using standard uh, monetization uh, methods at EPA, this would be valued at about $50 billion. Okay, so that is the value of the satellite information used in this uh, federal decision-making context. Uh, moving to a state agency context, this is another study that the, the Valuables Consortium is currently conducting. Uh, in the study, we ask, what are the socioeconomic benefits of using satellite data to monitor harmful algal blooms in freshwater recreational lakes? particularly when the decision is whether you close a lake to visitors or whether you post warning signs. Um, and so these are decisions made by the local uh, state uh, recreational agency or, or the health uh, department. And we look specifically at the case of uh, Utah Lake uh, in summer 2017, where we've talked to decision makers in the, the Utah Department of Environmental Quality who've told us that uh, they do receive this uh, satellite data from the SIAM project, um, and that in the absence of the satellite data, they would have missed uh, a harmful algal bloom in this summer. Okay? They would have not detected it as early as they did, um, and therefore they wouldn't have taken action um, uh, as quickly. And so in this, these are preliminary results, but we estimate that the fact that the satellite data allowed a more rapid identification of a harmful algal bloom and therefore decisions made uh, earlier in time in terms of uh, reducing human exposure to the toxins in the harmful algal bloom result in a 400 fewer cases of gastrointestinal illness. And when you uh, use uh, uh, published uh, estimates of the cost of treating gastrointestinal illness. This leads to about a $600,000 uh, worth of savings. So go moving on to the private sector, here's an example of a study that um, is not, uh, conduct, was not done as part of the Valuables Consortium. This was done uh, by a researcher at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, 
this uh, study asks, what are the socioeconomic benefits of using satellite data to discover new gold deposits? Okay, so this is actually a decision context in the private sector in which Landsat data are used. Uh, and this uh, researcher, uh, using a very clever, what he calls a natural experiment, exploiting uh, times and regions uh, of the world in which uh, Landsat data were not available due to technical failure, um, found that in these regions where Landsat data were absent, that gold discoveries were only half as productive as those where Landsat data are available. Okay, so extrapolating to the country the size of the U.S., this translates to additional gold reserve discoveries worth about $6.4 billion that can be attributed to the presence of Landsat data for this particular decision context. And finally, uh, this is another study that, that was done outside of the consortium by Isaac Morrison at MSI International. Uh, this is, uh, estimates the socioeconomic benefits of a frost prediction tool for Kenyan tea farmers and the specific decisions that Kenyan tea farmers can make thanks to uh, the availability, availability of a flood for, or a frost forecast is um, to pick tea leaves early or to uh, treat their crops in a certain way that makes them more resilient to frost. And bottom line is that the annual value of this frost um, prediction tool is about $80 per household, which is worth a lot in this particular case. So I'm out of time. Um, please let me know if you want to know more about the Valuables Consortium, and here's some contact information. Thanks. All right, let's move on to our next speaker, Greg Snyder from USGS, talking about a user-driven approach for meeting nations' imaging needs. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to uh, mention that the um, requirements, capabilities, and analysis for Earth observations is a project, new, fairly new project within the USGS Land Im National Land Im Imaging Program, um, and we have a component at headquarters, a uh, component at the Eros Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our mission partners include our uh, Integrity Applications Incorporator contractors, our partnership with NOAA. Now, I know a Tipio, Stippy, et cetera, so there's a lot of connections between this project and things that you're going to hear uh, in the other pres or have heard in the other presentations. Uh, let's see, go this way. Okay, just a real quick slide about National Land Imaging Program. Um, we uh, maintain and continue to maintain uh, the continuity of a long-term uh, moderate resolution archive into the future. Um, we are involved in collecting requirements from a whole host of sources. Um, uh, we coordinate uh, the access to classified data, um, and we develop civil applications and information tools um, and science-derived products, um, which we distribute through EROS. Um, just a, a vision statement for RCAO, um, really what we're trying to do is achieve um, to really bring user needs to the forefront for a lot of decisions. Um, our first calling was to provide a data set uh, to uh, the Sustainable Land Imaging Architecture Study Team, which my colleague will speak about, uh, but we'd also like to apply it um, to inform future government commercial satellite contracts, um, imagery programs such as the National Agricultural Imagery Program, and other decisions that the federal government makes, particularly about investments in land imaging. <clears throat> uh, so here's what we do. Uh, we capture the user needs. We characterize uh, a variety of systems, um, both um, U.S. government, foreign, commercial. Uh, we do uh, comparison um, to allow cro uh, architecture study evaluations to inform investments and in in which programs we get involved with <coughs> um, at USGS. Uh, Emily covered beautifully the uh, Earth Observation Assessment work we did, um, and that was actually used as a basis for building out the requirements uh, or user needs data for Landsat 10 considerations, early formulation, um, and we also promote land imaging, particularly across the USGS uh, in, our, in our science disciplines. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say a little bit about our, our data and tools. Right in the middle of that circle is our relational database and analytical tools. Um, that's a shared um, development with, with NOAA Tipio. Um, and then uh, around that, we have three data sets there. We have um, information about the benefits. That's at the top, the value models of the data sources. Um, we have um, information on capabilities, lower right, and then lower left, our user needs. 
Um, and then the way that, that flows is we can, do, we can do a comparison between needs and capabilities to, to rank or um, determine the, the uh, comparative benefits of a particular satellite solution. Um, and I'm going to kind of switch that text on the next level to say on, on the left, we do science and operational user needs. And with those value models, we can look at the particular benefit of um, a particular observing system for an agency, a mission, a program, a product. Uh, and then uh, on the lower left, between value models and, and capabilities, that's where we have the architecture uh, studies and future needs. So that goes into informing future capabilities or just linking a particular user need to a capability, which I'll show you uh, coming up. But that's just a snapshot of one of our uh, capabilities, you know, which happens to be Landsat in our database. And I, Greg Stencils will be providing some more information on that. But to, to a particular example, on the right you see user needs, and they could be from a whole host of projects across the Bureau, across the government. Uh, and then what we'll do is um, we'll do an automatic uh, matchup between those needs and a capability that can meet those needs. In this case, it's NISAR products, but you could see Terrasar in there, you could see uh, NVSAT, you could see a host of other observation systems that produce information like that. And then ultimately, we'd like to be able to score a set of systems or a single system against some subset of those user needs. Um, now, um, in terms of accomplishments, um, we uh, mentioned and we'll hear more about how we're using those needs to inform the, f uh, the future Landsat systems. Um, <clears throat> uh, we talked about the OSTP directed National Earth Observation Assessments, and we continue to use that data for, um, um, let's call it business intelligence or information about uh, where we can better provide uh, remote, remotely sensed data into our, into our bureau and the impacts of different systems or alternatives, or engaging our bureau, the appropriate people who rely on a particular data stream into um, so, uh, the um, formulation study teams for different, different sensors. So it really gives us a window into how we're using or could be using Earth observation within the Bureau or across the government and making those connections. Um, we also characterize emerging commercial remote sensing satellites that could be um, a component of, of the future Landsat program. And um, Greg Census can talk a little bit about, about that. But I'd just like to say sort of as a wrap-up direction, what we're trying to produce is something um, that I, I don't think it exists or has existed to date, which is, a, which is ultimately a capability, we're not there yet, where we have a very robust set of user needs, not just moderate resolution where we started, but lower resolution, higher resolution across platforms, um, across modalities to include radar, LIDAR, and we're able to take those systems and find um, the correct or, the, or, or sort of the optimal approach solution approach to meet a set of given needs or develop uh, or identify data gaps um, that, that then could be solved by future system formulation. So that's, that's, that's a stretch goal for us, but actually I think we'll be doing some of that uh, in the early spring, and, and it, hopefully it will be uh, you know, a useful tool to the community writ large. I think I have 17 seconds left. <laughs> Quick question. Yes. Um, well, so uh, one of the things that we've done is uh, we've, we've applied um, our database to get at folks who use that kind of data, and then through something that's, that's ongoing through USGO, which um, we've, uh, we've directed a, a, a set of requirements to NASA to inform that future uh, formulation, so they would be the ones that would provide it, or we could look at those sorts of observations and see if there are other sensors, again, because of requirements of system agnostic to see if there's anything. But we uh, personally are not, you know, planning a, a MODIS mission within USGS, but we have informed NASA of a variety of needs, and that concern has definitely been raised. And also the difference between, you know, MODIS and VIRS and, and, that, and the, uh, the equatorial crossing. So I guess that's, uh, that's it for me. So thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the audience. Um, 
I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Zhou Ting Wu from USGS. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a particular activity that uh, Greg Arizic already set a perfect background for, is sustainable land imaging uh, Landsat 10 user needs. And I'm only representing a team at, at Effort. We have our whole team from um, USGS National Land Imaging Program. Um, I'm sorry, I do not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> from from um, uh, IAI, from USGS Eros. So SLI, Sustainable Land Imaging, partnership is between USGS and NASA to work together to continue to provide this global, wide, uh, high quality land imaging data that's compatible with the 46 year uh, record of Landsat data. So talking about the history of Landsat, the first Landsat was launched in 1972. So now we're in 2018, we have two operational Landsat in orbit, Landsat 7 and 8. Um, Landsat 9 is scheduled to launch uh, late 2020 to 2021. Um, beyond Landsat 9, Landsat 10 is probably going to launch around 2027 timeframe. So for the NASA and USGS partnership, uh, NASA is responsible for the space segment and launch, and USGS is responsible for flight operations and data processing, distribution, archiving. So throughout the Landsat history, we've seen improvement um, across the board. We've seen spatial resolution increased from 80 meter to 30 meter. We've seen in, uh, additional spectral bands in visible shortwave infrared, thermal infrared, and atmosphere bands. Uh, we witnessed this um, increase in temporal resolution from 18 days to 16 days. We've also seen improved um, uh, radiometric performance, such as improved SNR, um, Im improved the bit depth from 6-bit data to 8-bit to 12 and 14-bit. We've also seen improved solar and lunar calibration. So Lensa has been evolving. Now we're talking about beyond Lensa 8 and 9. Um, so that's what our goal of this activity to collect user needs to inform future Landsat missions beyond Landsat 9 is to really try to understand the user community, understand what applications are, uh, what, how, what can we do to improve their ability to perform their current work. So the data collection was done in 2016-2017, um, primarily through the U.S. federal civil agencies um, to look at their, apl uh, their applications or rely on modern resolution like imaging data, either supporting operational or research work. Um, the data collection is through direct interviews. So really have this interaction with users, to understand what they do t t today, what they want um, in the future to better perform their applications. Okay, so we've collected hundreds of user needs, but we've seen some common trends throughout data collection. Uh, one of them is to improve the need for improved uh, spatial resolution for Landsat data. And here I just pulled up um, an example for agriculture. So imp improved spatial resolution can increase um, the, est uh, the accuracy for, for crop mapping or estimate for crop acreage, crop production, enable um, uh, to look at urban agriculture, precision farming. And the same goes thermal infrared as well. So users uh, need to have higher resolution for thermal infrared data to support uh, surface temperature retrieval, to look at evapotranspiration, to look at volcano and lava flow, and also in improved um, t um, thermal infrared resolution for looking at uh, nighttime imaging for volcanoes and active fire. Another common need we've seen across the board is increasing in temporal resolution. So right now, two lens that offers eight-day repeat coverage. Um, that's not even considering in the cloud probability. So a lot of applications we've run across need um, daily to sub-weekly clear observation. That means cloud-free observation. And the sub-weekly clear observation can support uh, applications like volcanoes, looking at fires, mapping flood and oil spills, also looking at water quality. Um, so water quality is an application that's an emerging application enabled by Landsat 8 with the additional spectral bands, improved uh, performance, like r radiometric performance. Um, so sub-weekly or daily clear observation can support water quality, look at water consumption, look at evapotranspiration, um, look at uh, shoreline change, and also support snow, looking at snow, ice, seasonal melt, and also glaciers. 
Okay, so we touched on the water quality application a little bit. Um, so water quality has been an um, like emerging application since Lancet 8 because additional coast aerosol band, but one band is not enough. Actually, water quality during our um, data collection, there are additional narrow spectral bands identified. Um, some in narrow, um, in green, in red, in red edge, uh, orange band. So it they identify a suite of narrow, um, spectral bands can retrieve different um, chlorophyll, different components of water. But ideally, they will like uh, continue spectral coverage from UV to near infrared, like the PACE mid mission. And this is just only one example, like water quality, just one application can benefit uh, from additional spectral coverage from future Landsat. So overall, we've seen um, a few common trends among all different applications. Um, users would like higher um, temporal coverage and um, subweekly to daily clear observation. Uh, so currently, Landsat offers 30 meter visible short infrared uh, spatial resolution, and users would like to see that um, increase to 10, 20 meter. And currently, two lens that offers 60 to 100 meter thermal infrared. Uh, users would like to see 30 to 60 meter thermal infrared. And then we've seen different applications identify a suite of narrow spectral bands across the spectrum in, um, from visible to near infrared to short wave infrared to thermal infrared. And ideally, we've seen a suite of applications can benefit from this continuous spectral coverage from visible to short wave infrared. And with that, I have. Time for questions. Go ahead. Uh, there's a lot of potential synergies between uh, the, the next generation land set systems and the uh, NASA and SMB set. Uh, could you talk about any possible kind of collaborations or any development? So, um, the SBG is having their study team to look at different architecture, their options for their instrument, and then we're also having architecture study to look at the different options. User needs is one input to, to that. Um, so the two teams are kind of looking at very similar imaging needs, uh, different architectures at the same time. There has been some conversation, discussion, and coordination between the two teams. But yeah, we definitely recognize uh, we're, we're potentially addressing their common uh, user needs and then could look at very similar technology. So um, in the next year or, or in the next couple of years, there's definitely going to be coordination between the two teams. And it's still really early on in the Landsat 10 develop. So we don't know what's going to be like yet. All right. So is Phil Dabney here? All right. So. Um, we, uh, our next talk is with Strong. Um, so now we got, we gained a, um, quite some time for answering questions for the four speakers we had already. Or someone can come sing and dance, tell a joke. I don't have that <laughs> talent. Go ahead. Um, I think we at least will have two, like what we're going to maintain Landsat continuity, um, the eco stress, um, the new eco stress sen sensor is a good example of um, what was, what can be done like with multispectral and it's definitely with, uh, we can look at the data to see what the benefits are in terms of um, emissivity, surface temperature retrieval, the separation um, is, there's definitely a possibility we should look into a multispectral uh, thermal beyond five bands. So right now we're just looking into different options and look at what the benefits can be gained by, by having more bands and also looking at the other side of the cost, technology feasibility. So those are all in consideration. Um, and hopefully uh, next year we'll have more update. But yeah, everything's on the table. We're looking at cross um, multispectral, hyperspectral. Go ahead. My question is for Emily. And uh, Emily, would you be able to comment on the path forward for the integration of these applications? Well, and I'll, I'll let Jason join in on this one. I, I think that our, we're going to be able to further articulate alongside what, um, what NOAA and USGS are doing now. For example, we know that uh, NOAA and USGS are incorporating data that, um, that could potentially reflect the Earth observation assessment data that we 
And so if you ask questions or answer, maybe use that mic so everybody can hear. So just for future questions. Or we still got some time. Go ahead. That's definitely a very strong consideration to make make sure Landsat Sentinel are compatible. So, like um, Sentinel two is definitely considered part of uh, our partners to looking at the uh, future of Landsat going forward. So, yeah, there's going to be very strong coordination between ESA and uh, NASA and USGS SLI to look at spectral band plate placement, spatial resolution, things like that, data format. Yep, absolutely. Oh, yes. Hi. I would like to know uh, about the plan for investment for the combined Landsat Signal 2 product uh, plus one more. Should I let Jeff answer that? <laughs> All right, thanks for answering and asking the questions. All right, let's move on to our next speaker, John Dwyer from USGS Arrows, talking about the evolution of Landsat Science products for earth science applications. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to take a couple minutes and give you an idea of where we've been um, on the USGS side of the Landsat program. Much of what I'm going to present really represents a team effort, our partnership with NASA, uh, other federal agencies, uh, university partners. Um, you know, back in 2008 when the data policy was changed, it really kind of revolutionized the the way in which people were, were access, or wanted to access and use Landsat data. Uh, we now went from the idea of using a couple of uh, images to look at change over time to really exploiting the full temporal depth of the archive uh, in large area studies. And so that meant a bit of a shift from our side in terms of the ground processing to try to meet the evolving needs of the user community. And we continue to try to respond to this based on information uh, gathered through some of the presentations that you've heard earlier, but also through our uh, university and federal agency partners and the Landsat Science Team and other groups. So this illustration uh, on this slide, in the past, we started with uh, scaled DNs representing calibrated radiances. If people really wanted to look at differencing over time, they had to accommodate for the differences in the calibration, cross-calibrate the different scenes, uh, perhaps normalize the effects of variable illumination geometry uh, and seasonality by moving to top of atmosphere reflectance. And then more recently moving to um, you know, true geophysical parameters such as surface reflectance where we can remove the effects of the intervening atmosphere and combined with the um, uh, appropriate calibration of the instruments and cross calibration really look at change on the landscape over time, not necessarily differences in the acquisitions. Um, and as part of doing that, <clears throat> a, a few years ago, we moved to change our paradigm in terms of how uh, we were handling Landsat data uh, uh, to prepare for this. And our level one products, basically orthorectified calibrated radiances, uh, we embarked on what we call a collection approach to doing this. Uh, because of the different characteristics of the instruments over time, uh, one of the things that we were hearing from the community was the need 
uh, not only to have the instruments radiometrically cross-calibrated, cross which we do at a system level, but to be able to align the pixels over time. And so we went to this collection concept, and as we build these collections over time, we stratify the collections based on the geodetic accuracy of the product. So tier one is less than 12 meter RMSE typically. Everything else goes into a tier two. And then we have a near real time collection as well because we need to get updated platform ephemeris and some other information before we can uh, fully process the data to either one of these tiers. Um, and then we embarked on a concept called analysis ready data, or ARD. And that's illustrated in this slide. Um, <clears throat> where we're performing consistent radiometric and geometric processing. We've updated our ground control point library over the globe, uh, so we have much more uh, density of points and higher accuracy. We've also cross-calibrated the instruments and we maintain those updates. And then we're systematically processing the data to surface reflectance and more recently surface temperature. So we've now got geometrically aligned uh, geophysical parameters by which we can really exploit the information in the archive. Now, uh, looking at the uh, graphics on the bottom, moving from the right to left, we've adapted uh, a tiling scheme from the web-enabled Landsat data project uh, from South Dakota State University. Uh, instead of distributing uh, data as scenes, we're now distributing in the ARD context as these tiles, which means that the upper left pixel in a tile will always be the same point on the ground. In contrast, if you look at the left side, uh, that illustrates the alignment of scenes. Now, scenes are geographically referenced, but because of orbital drift, you know, the position of that upper left pixel is going to change a little bit in terms of where it is on the ground. Another aspect that we can leverage uh, by moving to this tiling system is that there's a significant amount of overlap uh, between adjacent orbits. And when we go to the tiling scheme, we can exploit that to give us added measurements and observations uh, in the time scale for doing that. Well, this becomes important because one of the things that people are doing more and more frequently on large-scale studies is to exploit the temporal and the spectral dimension of the archive to look at changes in land cover, land use, and the condition of natural vegetation. And in this illustration, what we're showing in this plot is that on the y-axis are the uh, reflectance values of one of the shortwave infrared bands. And this is a pixel, pixel trajectory over time, uh, moving from left in the early 80s to uh, more recent to the right. And you can see that there's a uh, seasonal sinusoidal type of a uh, uh, curve uh, expressing the phenological cycles of vegetation. Then there's a discontinuity introduced into that curve. That's where there's been a change in uh, the state of the land cover. It could be forest clearing. Uh, there's a period of transition. The, uh, the model then restabilizes to reflect a new land cover uh, type that's in there. And then it goes to another change. So exploiting this time dimension uh, becomes extremely valuable. Now, to be able to do this, we also try to track pixel-level attributes in terms of the quality of the data. Are there clouds present? Are, is there radiometric saturation? Things that can help users filter the data so that they get uh, the best quality observations and measurements for their pixels of interest. Now, we've also, as we're moving to these higher-level data products, things like surface temperature, which is uh, extremely desirable for inputs into things like evapotranspiration modeling, but also to studies of lakes as a trigger, perhaps, uh, for harmful algal blooms, especially in areas where there's a lot of uh, agricultural land use intensity. And so now, <clears throat> recently, just a week ago, we've released a surface temperature product that will be aligned in this ARD format uh, going back through the Landsat TM record. We're also generating what we call a burned area product. So for each acquisition, we're mapping areas that could be disturbed either through uh, forest fire, fires, wildfires, or prescribed burning. We're looking at uh, dynamic surface water extent. And again, this is at each time step, as well as things like fraction of snow covered area. So the idea being is really to try to meet the needs of the community for not just data, but information that could be 
more readily ingested into either process models or decision support models. So thank you very much. Okay. Okay, next we have Frank Gallagher from NOAA. He's going to talk about the NOAA Satellite Observing, observing System Architecture and SOSA study. Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to um, say a good shout out for uh, Dr. Karen St. Germain, who uh, who's our director, uh, helps lead the study. Uh, Kate Becker also works with us. And uh, Mark Mayer and Phil Jasper from the Aerospace Corporation. Um, so right now, the, the, the satellites that we have up in orbit are actually doing a pretty good job. We just launched our most recent JPSS and, and GO-17, and they're doing actually quite well for the most part, um, giving uh, a pretty good amount of, of new data that we haven't seen before. Um, and we also take advantage of our partner data. So if we look at, the, at this figure here, you can basically see the things that, that we put in, in operational service right now that include the GOES, um, the JPSS series, and, and all of our partners, as I mentioned. Plus, we also have um, uh, the Discover out, in, uh, out at L1. But we know that these aren't going to last forever. So we also know that, that in taking uh, the development time for GOES took on the order of 13 years for getting GOES R from initial time period to when, we're, um, to when we first launched. So if we take a look at when the availability is going to start to decline for these current systems, we need to start working on uh, the next systems right now. So we started a study back in uh, about three years ago, the uh, NOAA Satellite Observing Systems Architecture Study. And what we wanted to do is take a look at, with, with a fresh sheet of paper, of how we could examine the space segment architecture. And we were just focusing on the space segment. And we wanted to see what functions could be allocated to what orbits. Are there new types of, uh, of measurements that we want to make? Are there certain types of measurements that we uh, don't need to stress as much? Um, and which uh, observations can be improved from the ones that we're making right now? But one of the key aspects of this study is that we focused on operational needs. So yes, we take advantage of, of NASA data uh, and other data that, that is non-operational, but we were looking at, at what is happening in terms of how does NOAA use the data in terms of, of life protection, uh, making watches and warnings and so on. So we scoped it very carefully. And we also wanted to make sure that we opened it up to leverage new space, things such as the commercial uh, public uh, uh, capabilities that are coming along. So if we take a look at this, focus on the top box. Uh, the bottom box basically shows our partner contributions, which we're assuming are going to be there. So you can see in the 2030 to 2035 time frame, um, the GOES and the JPSS system start to fly out. And that's about the time frame, or even a little bit earlier, depending upon reliability, uh, availability, when we need to get our next architecture up and in place. So what we did is uh, we did a very robust um, architecture study. We started off with defining our observational objectives, and I'll mention those in a minute. Um, we had some strategic objectives that our leadership in NOAA wanted to incorporate. And we also took a look at available technology and, and projected to future technology um, by developing an instrument catalog um, to see what would what we'd be able to assemble into um, satellite configurations and into uh, constellations itself. Uh, we developed various constellations, and we uh, ran them through various models, um, taking a look at what the costs were, scoring them against the, uh, the requirements that I'll mention in a minute, coming up with a nice cost-benefit curve, and then we would do this over and over again, and we did it actually four times, each time we were refining it. So in terms of strategic objectives, these are some of the things that um, leadership was interested in. Availability is very important, particularly of the core capabilities and all capabilities. Um, maintaining fixed budgets, um, and then you can read the list here. But one thing I want to mention is that we want to have low risk at the constellation level, not necessarily at the satellite level. Um, observational objectives, we have over a thousand requirements in our uh, database in NOAA. We needed to distill them down to make the, the the study tenable. So we had a group called the Space Platform Requirements Working Group that distilled these down into 19 objectives from the terrestrial side and 19 objectives from the space weather side. Um, the instrument catalog was developed by uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and it took uh, current technology and they, um, they projected out into the future. 
of all the different types of, of instruments that would be necessary to make the measurements in the objectives that I just showed you. And this box just gives a little snippet of some of the things that we looked at. Um, we had three different levels of capability from, from really, really low to really, really high. We wanted to expand the range to make sure that we had a, a, a very big trade space. So when we did all this, this is a, a subset of the constellations that we studied. We studied over 150 of them. And we found that, uh, that we could draw this efficient frontier curve. And we want to get close to the curve as possible in terms of cost-benefit ratio. We have cost along the bottom, uh, the x-axis, and value on the y-axis. And the orange line represents where we are about in 2025, the value we'd get in 2025. Um, so we see that we analyzed a, lot, a wide range of these, and what we found is that the radical alternatives that we came up with, things that, that were swarms of satellites or, or going completely hosted, um, just didn't work according to the rules of the study. But what we found was that a hybrid architecture where we moder moderately disaggregate scored quite well. So what we find out is that we have a, a mixture in geo. Instead of having two big satellites, we disaggregate into um, to a couple of different uh, varieties that I'll explain in a minute. And a mix of LEO, where we uh, maintain the higher availability satellites on uh, the higher availability measurements on their own satellite, and then we can sprinkle other um, lower availability measurements in, in other satellites. Uh, we also include a tundra orbit, so our Alaska friends are very happy, uh, where we can image basically uh, what we do with GOES-16 up in the Arctic, and we have a permanent presence, presence at L1 and L5. And this is an example of, of what a hybrid architecture might look like, um, showing imagers east and west, uh, hosted opportunities um, for uh, commercial engagement, and we also consider commercial purchases of data as well into the future. And in addition, we also maintain our, uh, our partnerships with, uh, with our international partnerships. So this provides us a different mix of observations. Um, quality and quantity of soundings uh, can be mixed and matched as you go along. We launch depending upon how, we, uh, how the constellation is. We want to have more agility. We want to make sure that we have um, more business models. So where do we go from here? Um, the study is finished. Like I said, we did three years of that. Um, we're starting our pre-phase A activities, both in GEO and LEO. We're outreaching to our industry partners. Um, and we're also starting to develop um, roadmaps on how we get from here to launch in the late 20s or early 30s. Great. Thank you. That's it. We we'll actually have some time for one quick question. Um, we, uh, uh, we had the, the Space Platform Requirements Working Group um, come up with uh, a range of, of values on, on improvement. So we wanted to see what was the value of improvement from the very, very low end to the very, very high end. Um, they ranked them, they, they suggested some rankings on the individual categories, the terrestrial and the space weather, and then we went to NOAA leadership and they did the final ranking across, uh, across that and we issued assigned weights. Uh, to the individual um, uh, objectives. And they were scored based on the weights and then multiplied across to a final score. Great. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so next we have Justin Goldstein from NOAA talking um, from, from, I'm sorry, from Fort Collins. Um, Riverside Technology talking about comparing satellite architecture studies using standard taxonomy approach. Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Justin Goldstein. I'm a contractor to NOAA in Silver Spring. I'd like to thank my co-authors, David Helms, Jason Taylor, and Marilyn Murphy. To begin this talk, it's worth thinking about how we perform a gap analysis. We have needs 
or their needs identified, and we're not sure if we could meet those needs or the manner in which we would meet those needs. Normally, we look at studies composed of requirements, capabilities, and strategic plans. After mining them, we would do a meta-analysis or a literature analysis in order to synthesize these three components for our analysis. But there are some issues, easier said than done. The topic of this talk will focus on the first one, that reports do not share standardized taxonomies. What one study may call something may in fact be synonymous with something else caused something else labeled in another study. And we're going to show examples of this. There are also prioritization schemes, same service employed. I'm not going to get into the second two, but I'll be around gladly answer questions about the other two following the close of this session. So let's take a use case towards how do we perform a gap analysis through synthesizing or harmonizing various products, pieces of literature, and so on. I'm going to focus on something called the Satellite Needs Working Group. This slide was provided by Mike Freilich. Uh, those who attended the Earth Science Town Hall yesterday or the day before may have heard about this. This is a mechanism through USGO through which federal agencies can tell NASA what type of scientific needs, observation needs from satellites an agency would need in order to perform its mission. NASA would then look at the various submissions and respond, yes, we can, no, you have a good case, but we don't plan to fly this instrument, or look to our partners for this piece, for the need that you need, for the need. So the question is, how do we perform a gap analysis to inform the satellite needs working group? Coming from NOAA, NOAA has specific needs, and we want to communicate to NASA what we need. The three items at which we're looking are the NASA Decadal Survey, which Dr. Freilich spoke about extensively, lays out the blueprint for NASA's Earth observation missions going forward, authored by the National Research Council. The first round of the Satellite Needs Working Group, which occurred in 2016, this is a biennial process, as well as the Space Weather Requirements Working, the Space Platform Requirements Working Group, and SOSA that Dr. Gallagher just spoke about. Look at these three. How can we inform a gap analysis so that we could tell NASA this is what NOAA needs to do its mission coming from satellites in the years ahead. So let's apply this model to, sl to the slide I mentioned earlier. This shows the Venn diagram of all of these three studies. If a specific need was communicated in round one in 2016 and communicated, let's say, in the Earth Science Decadal Survey, but not in NSOSA, we would consider that. Same thing if a need was communicated in all three items. But there's another level of complexity. The technical readiness level, TRL, has to be mature enough in order to interest NASA in flying because if it's going to take too many years to reach the technical readiness level, it might not be of interest to NASA by 2027. Now, back to the taxonomies issue. This is the Venn diagram, but turned on its side. We look at the Satellite Needs Working Group, the NSOSA requirements that are laid out in this thorough document, and NOAA's requirement database. We try to map them against what NASA is going to be flying anyway, what NASA is, thinks would be its program of record come 2025, 2030, as well as other NOAA needs. We need to put these two together because if one report uses one term, another uses another term, we need to harmonize them to perform the gap analysis. Now, why is this such a big deal? 
because what we may, what NOAA may consider an, ob, an objective, or what NASA considers a targeted objective, we have observables. We have atmosphere. Atm as a geographer, I was taught that atmosphere means the thermosphere, the ionosphere, etc. Whereas many would just say atmosphere is restricted to the troposphere. Requirements, observables, all these reports have different terms to define requirements going forward. How do we harmonize them? And here I laid out patterns through which we performed our analysis. If something is mentioned in the decadal survey, mentioned in satellite needs, but not mentioned in INSOSA, we would rate that. We would we would look at all of the terms put together using the World Meteorological Organization, the WIGOS vocabulary was our means for harmonizing. And we found good harmonization to the point where this is our findings. The first eight that are mentioned in green were submitted by NOAA in the first round. We were directed to resubmit them because the format for questions changed for this round. The next three were the results of our gap analysis. We, and the 12th was a false positive earth radiation, which matched our metrics, matched our procedure. But because the decadal survey did not explicitly allocate it to a recommended mission going forward, it identified the need, didn't assign it to a mission, we took it off the list because we wanted to really stay true to the NASA decadal survey. Final takeaways, the framework approach does work for gap analysis. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, time permitting. Thank you. Okay. We, have, we have less than a minute if anybody has a quick question. Our next speaker is Steve Marley. Um, he will talk about opportunities for assessing observation system value. Thank you. Thank you for uh, hanging around this late on a Thursday. Uh, I'd like to recognize my, uh, my co-author, David Holmes, and his contribution to uh, this presentation, as well as the broader uh, TIPIO team that I work with and have the privilege of presenting uh, this material to you. Um, what I want to talk about is how NOAA goes about its broader um, uh, problem space of assigning uh, portfolio management priorities to its observing systems. Um, we have a, we've developed over the last um, five years now a tool called NOCEA, the NOAA Observing System Integrated Analysis uh, Framework. It was, uh, is constructed uh, between 2013 and 2015 and consists of uh, foundational data which we share with, um, uh, with USGS as well as methodologies which are in line with what you heard uh, uh, earlier from uh, OSTP and STIPI. Um, we're in the middle right now of doing a, a, a refresh of uh, some of the foundational data as well as looking at uh, uh, technologies and applications that we're going to be developing in the future. The NOCEA tool is uh, one of the fundamental tools which is used by the NOAA Observing Systems Council, which is the authoritative body that decides how um, investments for observing systems are, uh, are, are allocated within NOAA. And all of that follows a process which, uh, which is defined by uh, a particular uh, administrative order that was uh, developed in 2016. So this is the problem space that we're, um, that we're looking at. At the bottom, you'll see the sustained observing systems. And so that's typical of the satellite systems you see, but also of uh, buoys and of um, ships and aircraft and uh, radar, almost anything that we, that, we, that we deal with that takes observations. Um, those support a sustained set of data products, which are then put into what is essentially the, 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 
the meat, if you like, of what NOAA does, and that is our, model, our modeling products. And those modeling products then form, uh, satisfy um, products and services, which are essentially the user-facing view of where, uh, of where NOAA interacts with both its federal stakeholders, but also state and public stakeholders. At the top of all of that is the societal benefit. And what you'll see, if I can get this to work, Right now, the systems that we have in place sort of stop at that level, at the portfolio analysis level. There is um, a lot of interest by our, um, uh, uh, by current leadership to extend the benefits to, thank you, to extend our benefits to um, uh, the uh, societal benefit areas, and there's work underway right now to try and fold in, particularly the type of analysis that we heard earlier, uh, to look at what is the financial, we know what the costs are of our systems, what is the extension, what is the benefit of those systems to the broader society. So you've seen something similar from this before with, with Stippy. This is a fraction of our observing um, systems. On the left-hand side, you'll see um, a collection of our observing systems. I've got about 10% of, um, of all of our observing systems. We have over 100 observing systems. Our satellites, which are our dominant expense, um, represents only about 4 to 5% of, of everything that we observe. And so the vast majority of our systems are much smaller in investment, but have a much broader scale, scope and impact across, uh, across our space. The area in the middle is the mission service areas, and that's how we um, describe the priorities for how we operate. Um, and then on the right is the societal fit, and that's the links that we're developing uh, as we go forward. The NOCEA value tree, um, I'll skip this one pretty quickly, is the way that we build our model. At the top in the green are our sort of our directives, our policies, our, um, our, our political direction, and, our, and, and that sort of level. The middle layer is the service products, and those are the ones that are supported by the observing portfolio. And so you have a look at that stack as to how we actually then contribute and draw the line between how, what does an observing system contribute to the mission that NOAA is, is, is about. There are sort of three perspectives. Um, that we can that we have within our system. The first one is, if you like, is the planning perspective, the senior leadership perspective. The sorts of questions you ask here is, are we satisfying our mission? Does a what what a, does a particular observing system? If you have a look at the middle column, if you could look at that detail, you'd see it's the geos, it's the geostationary environmental satellites. What do they contribute to in terms of the mission services areas that were in the middle column of the of the of the previous graph? On the, on the far right is, is how do we rack, rack and stack all of our observing systems from most important to least important, given the priorities and the policy directives and the mandates that get handed down to us and, uh, in, our, in our various acts and, uh, and budgetary guidelines. Below the senior leadership level is sort of the project management level within a sort of particular mission service portfolio. How do I balance my investments across the various aspects that I have? This particular example is talking about the uh, marine transportation portfolio. How do I balance um, spending money here or there or somewhere else within those portfolios? And so we also support those types of discussions. As well as down at the, um, at the project level, once we actually have a particular observing system, where do I spend my money in terms of developing products and services so that they maximize the benefit to, um, to the end user? So we can use this environment all the way from uh, managing tactically, tactically budget, annual budgets at a project level all the way up to gross planning for things like the Insosa architecture, what's my 15-year budget for my, uh, for my next generation of satellites. So moving into the future, we are in the middle of adding capability to our, uh, to, to our uh, system right now to include um, a better understanding of how our mandates and uh, policies directly interact with the value system, um, integrating the, um, the research view into the model and with performing direct linkages with the NOAA research database, the NRDD, this year. Um, looking at future satellite capabilities and how we actually then um, support the extra value that those satellites are going to give, and also a whole collection of other things. So I won't uh, go into those details as I've run out of time. Thank you very much.
We have, again, less than a minute for a quick question if anybody has one. That's the post five o'clock. People want beer. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Greg Stensis from USGS. He's gonna talk about new space, new space explosion and Earth observing system capabilities. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, like he said, my name's Greg Stensis. I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the folks that, that work with me. Greg Schneider talked earlier, Kimberly Casey works uh, with him on the capability side at headquarters, and then John Christofferson is the guy who actually does the numbers counting. So um, thank him. I like to thank him for that. But I did put new space explosion on there. I know that's probably not a good term because people don't like explosions, but it, but it did get people interested. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the number of satellites that have been launched in the past and and what we're kind of seeing in the future. Um, in 2017, there were 167 uh, satellites launched, land imaging satellites. The trend is continuing to, to continue to grow, uh, maybe not quite as large as 2017, but um, 2018, we're at 110 land imaging satellites. That doesn't include uh, anything smaller than a 3U cube. A sat, we've kind of left the nanosats and everything off the list, but um, there are other ones that are being launched that are smaller than that. So we don't know where it's going to go in 2019. CIOS has a lot of missions planned um, in the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites arena from uh, all the space agencies around the world. So things are, uh, are moving. Um, a couple of Things that are key here, I think you, you notice that the bottom line is the space-based earth, earth observation is really growing. Amazon announced that they're creating a new service so that they can port data directly from the commercial satellites uh, into the cloud. Um, we just recently had the launch from the ISRO um, system and uh, they launched uh, 30 satellites. One uh, of interest is the hyperspectral system that we'll hit a little bit more on. And then the SpaceX amazing uh, capability to come back and put the uh, stage right on the center of the target on the ship um, for reuse of a launcher. But they also launched uh, 64 systems in that one launch. So pretty incredible of where things are going. Um, so uh, I will just mention here that not all of those 94 systems that were launched in those two last launches were Earth observation systems. About 35 of them were. Uh, I mentioned the HISIS, which is a hyperspectral imager that we're really interested in from, for many reasons, for calibrations, for plant and vegetation species, mineral species assessment. Um, we're missing Hyperion uh, in the EO-1 mission, so we're, we're very excited to see what that'll do. Um, the SkySats, the, the doves from Planet, um, and then a, new, a second functioning land mapper from Astro Digital. Uh, Black Sky Global launched one and two, they're high res meter class systems that are out there. And we also have seen some other Spectral Venier from a Finnish company, and then Seahawk um, is a small system that is claiming it can do the same thing as CWIS did at 50% uh, of the signal-to-noise ratio. So a lot of interesting things happening in that, that commercial satellite, small satellite world. Um, <clears throat> the countries that have launched land in imaging satellites so far are 46 countries. Um, and uh, the CIOS has uh, 34 space agencies members and it's continuing to grow. Um, the key here is the, the shift, the paradigm shift that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of these traditional systems uh, out there being joined up with many of the small sats and the CubeSats 
uh, even additional systems on the I ISS. Um, we're really kind of looking for, I think, a way to put these systems together so we can better calibrate and validate across missions. Um, also, you're seeing all the aerial systems. The UAS is doing amazing things with doing bundle adjustment uh, to get very good uh, qu geometric quality. And now we're trying to work to figure out how we're going to do radiometry and, and manage all these new data sets. But I think the key here is, is understanding these new sensors and the technologies and putting them together um, in a way that we know how we can use the data um, across many of the applications. You saw the requirements stuff we talked about. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do there um, to understand them better, try to integrate them, get ready for where things are going in the cloud environment. Um, we have created a, a USGS uh, Aeros Calibration Center of Excellence to help us understand better um, where we need to go in the future by using a lot of the calibration and validation work that we've done in the past. Um, we also have a, a joint agency commercial imagery evaluation uh, um, team that's made up of NASA, NGA, NOAA, um, USDA, and USGS. We use this team and we have workshops every year to understand the, the capabilities and the qualities of these systems. Um, we have tied that together with a, an annual workshop for our, our Aeros uh, Calibration Center of Excellence, which focused on trying to bring together the Sentinel and Landsat data sets with small sats um, this year. So, so things are, are moving well in that arena. Um, we had 165 people register, and everybody likes Silver Springs uh, and College <laughs> Park, I should say. Um, so we probably will go there again. Um, you've heard a lot about the RCA for, for EO. Um, I just want to acknowledge the fact that we are moving into the airborne systems, the UAS systems, trying to utilize that information and link the requirements and capabilities together. And we want to take advantage of some of the stuff you've heard from NOAA um, and try to use some of the philosophies they have there. And you've also heard of the Sustainable Land Imaging Architecture Study Team. Uh, we probably will use uh, um, some of the other uh, commercial data sets to, to do more research on where things are going in the future in that arena. And with that, we're, we're staying current with tools. Um, Greg showed you this chart about the database where we're, we have all the information on the systems out there. We have a best practices for doing uh, comprehensive quality assurance and characterization, and you'll be seeing those right after the first of the year, January, March timeframe. And bottom line, um, we need to have a well-defined calibrated system in order to make these things work together. Thank you. Is our next speaker John Ranson here? Okay, I don't have your slides uploaded. So, I mean, do you, did you upload your slides in this? Okay. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Okay, so our next speaker um, is John R Ranson, and his talk is on small set constellation for future diurnal observations of terrestrial ecosystem structure and function. Thanks. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, something a little bit different. Um, this starts off with the Cato survey emphasizing vegetation structure and function as part of what NASA should be doing over the next 10 years. One could look at this idea as a, as a response to that, and, but maybe opening up the discussion on how, <clears throat> excuse me, how we can really do structure and function measurements effectively from space. Uh, the, 
the first slide there shows three satellites, two small sats, and a large uh, spectrometer, something like SPG might be. These are in an orbit where the, the two small sats are following the track of the larger satellite. The larger satellite has full spectrum uh, reflectance measurements useful for vegetation functions. These two small sat satellites follow behind and are doing two things. One, they're acquiring the bands needed for vegetation functioning and they're acquiring high resolution stereogrammetry to get structure, so the structure and function. But, but importantly, they're doing it with, by, and while they're doing it, they're sampling the diurnal uh, part of the, the cycle. In other words, they're, it's not just one time, it's three times, and you'll see, you'll see why, hopefully. So it's all about vegetation and its importance. It's all about vegetation productivity. We depend on that, of course, for food and for oxygen to breathe. And in the process of these vegetation canopies taking in sunlight and through photosynthesis converting it to more plant material, uh, it's affected by the environment. It's affected um, soils, uh, soil moisture, light, temperature, nutrients, and, and very, a bunch of different things. And these respond re in their reflectance characteristically. And we can, using the right bands, we can understand functionally what's going on with the canopy. During the course of the day, that changes. It's not, it's not a constant for a day. And during the course of the day, the sun is changing. So the sun angle changes as does the shadows on the canopy. So how do we correct for that? Well, I figure that we, if we could model that canopy in high resolution, we know where the shadows are, and we can then adjust our measurements or correct our measurements for that process. So um, structure, function, correct shadows. That's kind of what the gist of this, and do it diurnally. I'm not going to labor on this slide, but you just get the idea that we've got leaves out there taking up CO2 using water and sunlight in photosynthesis to reduce carbohydrates and sugars. And as part of that, there's a lot of things going on in these cells. There's different uh, pigment. The concentrations of pigments are changing, the different types of, of uh, pigments, and that's expressed in the reflectance. So if, if a plant gets too hot, it kicks in a, a certain uh, cycle of, of pigments and we can see that by using spectral information. Um, we also, what's important is the structure of the canopy. You see the, the images um, on, the, on the right side there, at least on my right side. Um, well, anyway, three different forest canopies, different structure, different shadows, and those change during the day as well. This, this is the curves express, or the curves on the bottom express the change of reflectance over time. That's during the day, from about 10 in the morning to 5 in the evening. And those different levels reflect the, the, the joint thing of changing shadows and changing functioning. So we have to be able to account for that. So if we know the structure of the canopy, then we can actually ferret out what that, what that shadow is doing to our measurement and improve that. That, that is uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. As well as getting the spectra. Now, the concept that we have is not to do a spectrometer, but it's actually to sample using wavelength bands like Landsat, but adding in some that are key for vegetation functioning because those are not on the satellites yet. I'm sure they will be. But we have to make sure that they are and, um, and we have them. And so that's, this concept incorporates them. So the, di the small satellites can provide diurnal structure and function measurements. So we can quantify vegetation structure and correct for that shadow I talked about. We can describe the diurnal changes in the vegetation productivity and biogeochemical responses to how the environment changes. Um, let me go up just 
back quickly. This bottom figure shows the actual reflectance measurements over time. And so think about what's happening here with um, sunlight ch changing through the day. That far curve over there on the far end is a representative of, of good even conditions. So there's no stress. The second two curves show stress occurring during the day. So if you sample only one time of the day, you're not going to catch it. So you sample, we're going to sample literally three different times a day to fill that in. Just wanted to make sure that that was clear to everybody. So we'll measure that as functional properties using the right spectral bands over time and um, be able to improve the productivity measurements. We'll tie those measurements to tower flux sites for calibration and um, come up with ways that we can actually, we're, we're expecting to be able to inform other missions that are trying to do similar things. So here's some real brief uh, pictures. Here's a three small stack constellation that would do the structure and function measurements across the day. Here we're leading it with that big SBG to get spectral measurements at one time a day and then we're filling in with two other days. And then here's a concept that actually uses a space station in the middle. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks for doing. Okay, so our next speaker is Bente Lila Bai, and she's going to talk about towards functional oriented Earth observation systems. So um, thank you. I'm, I'm very honored to be here in this group with this group of people being a user of Landsat, in particular imager for so such a long time. I come from Norway, so I guess I'm the only one from Europe here. Uh, I represent the small company BLB together and together with a whole bunch of other partners uh, that you see here. We are together in a project called Next Geos, funded by the European Commission. And um, I will start to uh, explain a little bit what we mean by function-oriented, give you a brief overview of what NextGeos is, the services, and then go into the five-step user experience before I summarize. So function-oriented, we have talked a lot now to, about all the data. Uh, but the data, uh, and we have been focused in, in the group of Earth observation, uh, a lot of uh, collecting, a lot of um, amount, amount of data. Now, now we are focusing more on how we can use, how the, they can function in society. And being fair, or the geo uh, data sharing uh, principles, or the fair principles, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is not enough. Uh, we need to transfer the data into information, and it doesn't happen by itself. Uh, people need to be involved uh, together with uh, technical uh, technology tools. In brief, uh, the Next Geos project is funded by the European Commission. We are set out to build a next generation European data hub and um, survey platform. It's a contribution to a call from the European Commission uh, uh, to defragmatize the European contribution to Geo and the, and the Geo work program. And we got 10 million euros, uh, 27 partners ranging from small companies, big companies, universities, and uh, organizations like uh, WMO and uh, OGC. We will end in 2020. Now, the concept of NextGeos is to engage with the communities. And uh, the purpose then is to um, give these communities access and combine them and put them together seamlessly with cloud uh, resources and other technology. Um, the specific profile of this project, among others, 
uh, is that we are contributing to the sustainable development goals. You will see uh, more about uh, our showcases, our pilots. Then on the technology side, we have user feedback mechanism. Uh, we have of the data hub, we have advanced discovery tools and again, a community enhancement. We work with people in the communities. So next year, uh, and I would like to see this, this is not yet another portal. This is actually a service for the portal, uh, commu for the communities using portals. We have three categories of uh, offerings or services, engagement services, the platform services, and the pilots uh, themselves. So first, we call it the engagement services. It's just a, a sort of low threshold uh, offering where we offer uh, European projects to um, catalog their data on our data hub. Uh, also the outcome of um, projects. Some t often they, they sort of uh, get lost. Uh, so we are offering an opportunity to create visibility for this. And we also offer an opportunity to have external pilots. And you will learn more. Uh, the platform services are meant to support the pilot integration activities, and we have three different uh, types of ser uh, services and technology-based, uh, data processing, user management, analytics, and reproducibility, and discovery with the data hub and uh, catalog search. Now, pay attention to one important thing here, or two important things, and that is that the technology is scalable and portable. So. Um, and, and, and cloud agnostic. So we will mention some examples of clouds here. Uh, this service here is cloud, cloud agnostic, so you can put it on, uh, deploy it on any cloud that you wish. And you can select from all these different types of, of technologies to use on your, on your data. We have um, 10 pilots, two categories. Some of them are focused on, um, on the <coughs> research, on the innovation part. Others are closer to commercial and operational, but this is a research project, so it's not an operational service, but they are, we have two categories like this. And we are supporting the, this is valuable in itself, uh, contributions to the sustainable development goals, and it's also contributions in ver of various kinds to the GEO work program. So, for instance, biodiversity here is a contribution to the GeoBond flagship, if you're familiar with, with Geo, and so on, the disaster risk reduction, agriculture, so for, for GeoGlam, uh, food production, and so on. So, uh, with the time limit, I cannot go into detail, but this is an important service we have. So, how can NextGeos help you? Um, and then we, have, we, have, we can help both data providers and users. And we have a five-step user experience, uh, including an onboarding process. Remember, I said it's about humans as well, and in built-in capacity building. So these are the five steps. Uh, we start to engage with the users to know what they, they need. We prepare the data they need, set up a platform, integrate the pilot, and then we have an operational service. So the user engagement is uh, where we try to understand what exactly the pilot is about and what they need, and we kick off. Oh, I am sure I don't have much time. So the data preparation is where we assess the uh, applications and their availability, and I want you to notice here the technical meetings. So in this process, we have technical meetings with people. We want to help them use the data. And uh, the platform set, uh, setup is similar. You have these uh, different uh, tools here. Notice that we are using CCAN. I am, I'm mentioning specifically this here in America because uh, CCAN is also being used by Amerigios. So this facilitates uh, a global cooperation um, on, on, of this tool. So we integrate the pilot, the service operations, and then we have this onboarding. And I want you to pay attention to, we are actually defining uh, personas, because each of these steps, uh, we are engaging with different types of people, with different roles and different skills. So we are tailoring this onboarding to what they need. And um, uh, one of the things that we are using, we are using training, so uh, capacity building built into in this process. We have a series of webinars, and we are an open uh, community with open source, open uh, data, and the Inspire hackathons, so uh, uh, organizing hackathons, is where we engage with with out, people outside the community as well. So user-centric, we provide community support, 
It's not the portal. We are supporting the portal. It's scalable and portable, technology agnostic, and it's open and transformation of uh, data to information. Um, if you want to know more uh, about us and follow us, um, take, uh, make contact with us. You can follow us on Twitter. That's where you get really the, the latest information. Otherwise, we have the website that will be continuously updated also. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir, we kind of like our format is kind of quick and just cover a variety of topics. So hopefully we get um, time with the speakers after the session. All right, let's move on. Okay, our next speaker is Haley Ricker. Um, she will talk about improving forest management through early detection of bark beetle outbreaks. Thank you. Thank you all for being here uh, so late on Thursday afternoon. Um, so let me cut to the chase. All right, bark beetles in the southeastern United States, especially Ips and southern uh, pine beetle species, can cause extensive damage to important forest resources. Uh, forests provide uh, ecosystem services such as water filtration, uh, timber, wildlife habitat, and recreation opportunities. Um, but bark beetle outbreaks can kill large patches of forests uh, and have detrimental effects. In the US, insects and pathogens associated with them impact 45 times more forest area than wildfire. Bark beetle-induced forest mortality in the southeast is estimated to cost approximately $43 million annually um, and increases fuel and therefore risk for wildfires. So for um, effective uh, intervention to protect these important resources, uh, managers need to be able to detect bark beetle outbreaks in the early stages. So um, NASA Develop partnered with scientists from the Forest Service's Eastern Forest Environmental Threat Assessment Center to develop a tool that would allow for earlier identification of bark beetle uh, infestations. Currently, the center utilizes uh, a forest disturbance detection tool called Forewarn. Um, and this system uses MODIS observations to calculate vegetation index changes um, that indicate mortality. Um, unfortunately, the pixel size of MODIS imagery is 250 meters, um, and that area contains a lot of trees. This means that once enough tree crowns are red for detection in the forewarn system, uh, widespread mortality has already occurred. So our team wanted to use some newer technology with higher spatial, spatial resolution, and in the case of Sentinel-2, additional bands in the red edge region to determine if detection of bark beetle attacks in the southeast uh, using remote sensing could be improved. Uh, we used imagery from Landsat-8, Operational Land Imager, and Sentinel-2 multispectral instrument. And then we compared those two products from Forewarn that use the MODIS imagery. Our project took advantage of a high incidence of bark beetle attacks occurring between uh, 2016 and 2017. And we focused on the Oconee National Forest in Georgia because of the availability of verification data sets. Um, so we modeled our uh, project after Forewarn's current monitoring method uh, creating comparison maps, looking at the change in indices that occurred over time. Um, because of limited presentation time, I will just present some results from the annual change maps that we created um, that show changes in vegetation indices from May of 2016 to May of 2017. Um, and these were evaluated using uh, aerial survey data, uh, identifying potential bark beetle outbreaks um, from July of 2017. So the indices we evaluated included normalized difference, difference vegetation index, or NDVI, which is the same one currently used um, with the MODIS imagery in the forewarn system. We also looked at normalized difference moisture index, or NDMI, um, and inverted red edge chlorophyll, or IREC, 
which takes advantage of the red bands, uh, the red edge bands in Sentinel-2. Here you can see all changes in these indices uh, colored in a same change indication scheme where positive or no change appears in blue um, and negative change is in green, yellow, and red. Negative changes in these indices indicate less healthy foliage, uh, which can be a result of bark beetle activity. These side-by-side -side comparisons contrast the differences in resolution as well as the effectiveness and sensitivity of the various indices. So um, the top right corner map shows what the forewarn um, in DVI change would be at the modus uh, pixel scale. So all of the change maps we produced and tested averaged about 70% agreement with the available aerial survey data. Um, but it is important to note that damage locations are approximated from a moving airplane um, and not ground truth. Uh, so take that result with a grain of salt. But I'd like to point out um, this uh, comparison at a closer upscale than the previous maps. So what we see here is um, a close-up comparison of the imagery, the change maps that we created, uh, located around a known um, bark beetle spot, which is represented by this pink triangle, which is kind of hard to see. Um, but it's right here, and it's uh, in the same location in each of these um, insets. So um, basically, we can see that higher resolution imagery from Landsat 8 OLI um, and the Sentinel-2 MSI improve precision in locating smaller patches of disturbed forest. Um, and some of the uh, indices we calculated are more sensitive to changes in forest condition, um, although all the vegetation indices appear useful. So uh, in conclusion, negative changes in these indices in DVI and DMI and IREC are correlated with known bark beetle activity. Um, the newer data products from Landsat 8 OLI and Sentinel-2 MSI provide higher spatial resolution view of bark beetle activity compared to the MODIS and DVI products. Um, and then the Sentinel-2 um, inverted red edge chlorophyll index change map appear to show a greater potential for identifying the early um, signs of an outbreak. Uh, we're continuing to look into evaluating these products we've developed. Um, but our investigation shows that this can be a useful tool for managers. And I just wanted to point out, uh, as Dr. Wu presented in her um, presentation, that uh, red edge bands and increased temporal resolution to deal with the high volume of um, cloudy images that we get in the southeast would really improve the usefulness of uh, an application like this. And with that, um, I'd like to thank all of my funding sources that have gotten me here and continue my work on this project and all of my collaborators. And thank you for your time. I'm going to move on to the next speaker. I'm going to switch computers here. Okay, next we have Robert Washington Allen. Um, he's going to talk about reanalysis of wood encroachment of U.S. drylands with finer resolution modus LST. Okay, um, thanks for coming. Let me just get right into this. I'd like to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-authors on this. Um, uh, uh, John McNeilis, Jack, um, in the back there, and, and uh, Wan Wan Liang at um, University of Tennessee, Rosalind March now at the um, Leiden University, and uh, Matt Rees with the uh, US Forest Service. Conclusions. 
Yeah. Usually, this is going backwards. Let's see something here. That's weird. I'll try it this way. Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> Gonna use the bottom key. All right. Um, my interest is in um, dryland ecosystems all around the world, and, and what I'm really interested in is is their sustainability, um, and uh, and and the pastoral societies that use it. They're the sustainability of those pastoral societies, and. What I'm really interested in, and in, along with that, is is in terms of how you go about monitoring those systems for sustainability. You know, up, down, or in the middle. Um, what's happening with them? Are they degrading or not? And uh, the approach that we decided to take to take a look at this was to use remote sensing data sets in order to do this. And um, what we were looking at was the productive capacity issues for U.S. rangelands and what the impact was from the U.S. livestock herd. And in doing this, and in looking at productivity. Um, for these systems, we, we discovered that um, globally, the response that we were seeing for U.S. Uh, rangelands was also happening around the world, which is that this greening effect was taking place, which basically was saying that, um, well, the systems were sort of getting better or that they were um, becoming more productive. It turns out there's various answers as to um, what this trend means, but for the, quest the question for us was, what did it mean for the um, U.S. dryland system? So we acquired the, um, the MODIS net primary productivity uh, data set and we did a, some ad adaptations to it where we converted it to above, above ground net primary productivity. We also then multiplied it by two to convert it to standing biomass because what we realized is it actually represented the forage available to livestock um, in, the, in these grazing systems. So this is what that trend looked like. And interesting enough, this, this trend is, um, if we look at it at least from 2000 to 2007, where you see the, the peak, um, that's about a 15% increase in productivity of these, range, these rangeland areas. And there was a recent call from USDA uh, uh, for their sustainable agriculture um, program, where one of the milestones for that program was to show that you have an increase in productivity of at least uh, annual productivity of 2%. And, and to me, this is kind of interesting because if we decided to go for this money in the rangeland systems, these systems are already increasing in productivity. But the question was, for what reason are these, are these systems showing this particular increase? But it's kind of nice we'd meet the milestone. So what I wanted to know is whether or not woody plants were a driver of this change in the, in the, uh, the greening. And that is what we call um, woody encroachment, which is basically woody plants um, taking over from the grasslands or shrubland environments. Because that was one of the primary hypotheses that was put forward to by many range um, management experts um, within the US, that it was woody plants that were coming in. And so we wanted to know, could you see this greening effect? One of the, the easier ways to approach this would have been to take the modus land cover product and probably look at it to see whether or not we saw an increase in Woody. But when you read their particular theoretical document, they tell you, do not use this data set in a change detection mode. So we were left with, OK, then how do we do this? How do, how do, how do we try to find out whether or not Woody plants are actually taking over? And there was a really nice, elegant paper that was written back in 1997 by Nemanja and Running, where they talked about this work by Priestley, where he showed in 1966 that most forested ecosystems showed a land surface temperature of about 35 degrees. So if you had a totally forested covered area, um, you would have about, about a 35 degree Celsius temperature. And this had to deal with the evapotranspiration that was occurring, and also the, the surface roughness and turbulence that was occurring within those systems. And so it turned out that and this is a biogeographic question where you can actually map the distribution of forests based on the 35 degrees Celsius. So I take the land surface temperature product and basically map their distribution based on that. And so this is the biogeographic aspect of that where you can see different forest distributions based on air temperature and precipitation. And this was the work by um, Middle Rexler, a student of Steve Runnings. Um, who then showed that there's a surface difference of about three degrees Celsius between the, the LST product and the um, different weather stations. And so on the right, on the left, you can see the, um, the land surface temperature delineation at the 38 degrees Celsius cutoff. And in, uh, on the, on the um, right, you see the land cover um, product. So we show for forested areas. So this led to 
this hypothesis, which is that basically between that 38 degrees and 35 degrees Celsius, um, if MPP is increasing and it, the cause of it is woody encroachment, we would see a trend of decline in the land surface temperature product um, towards the 30, 30, 38 degree, 35 degree um, transitional zone. So we then basically had to define what dry lands were. I'm not going to go into that. It's really long because there's over 300 definitions of what dry land systems are. But we did use an internationally recognized definition um, by the UNCCD United Nations Convention on the Combat Desertification. We then selected the mean LST data that we wanted for the month of peak LAI. And so we used the LAI product in order to identify that. And then we um, plotted that, of course, versus time. And then we did trend analysis basically using linear or polynomial regression. So this is an example of the LAI product uh, for July 2010 for the U.S. drylands. This is what that trend looked like then across that, and then we use this then. These are the ones that we selected, um, the LST that we selected using the LAI. This is um, what that data set looks like, um, at least up to 2012, and I'm going to show you to 2018, this final result. And this is what we found. It wasn't a significant trend. But it was a declining trend. The slope was negative, um, as we predicted um, it would be. And it, the, the issue here is maybe not, um, maybe not statistically significant, but maybe ecologically significant. Um, but we had to do a reanalysis. Just as we were getting ready to put this to press um, with global change biology, we discovered that um, the, the version 6 had come out. And the first thing it says for version 6 it was it's improved for semi-arid and arid regions. So we needed to go back and do the reanalysis. We did the reanalysis, and we, we got the same trend again. So again, what we're concluding here is that um, it looks like woody encroachment is happening. It's a trend in, in uh, land surface temperatures. It's not statistically significant, but it is ecologically significant. And with that, I'll take questions. Um, sorry, we don't have time for questions. We have one last right. talk. And then, if you and then, and then we'll, around, yeah, yeah, I'll be around. Okay. So I hope the speakers will stick around. Yeah, so you use these okay, I'm, still in, I'm still on that presentation mode, yeah. so yeah. Want to introduce yourself? Or? Oh, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> okay, our last speaker is um, Steve Eccleson. He will talk about uncertainty in the retrieval of shallow coastal, sh shallow coastal properties from remote sensing. All right, thank you for hanging in there on this next to last day. Um, Coastal ecosystems are uh, on the front line of climate change. Uh, they're the, being significantly infected, affected even today. Coral reefs are some of the most vulnerable ecosystems. A recent report by uh, UNESCO uh, it concluded that uh, if current climate tra uh, trends continue by the end of the century, uh, most uh, coral reefs worldwide, uh, including the services that they provide and the biodiversity that they support, will either be significantly diminished or uh, will uh, be disappear altogether. And for this reason and for other reasons as well, and in response to uh, arguments articulated within the last two decadal surveys, uh, NASA is um, uh, developing a rather ambitious um, surface um, satellite sensor called the uh, Surface Biology and Geology Sensor, or SBG. Um, it will be, uh, is envisioned as a continuous <laughs> spectrometer across the visible and near-infrared spectrum with rather fine spectral sampling and fairly high spatial resolution. Um, the uh, notional uh, sensor noise for that sensor expressed as a signal-to-noise ratio was 400. And we asked the question, is this good enough for coral reef research? A little bit about sensor noise. Uh, the sensors today, um, the noise is de dependent upon the amount of photons that you detect. Um, and as you start um, uh, dividing up the, the spectrum that you sense into finer spectral 
bands. And as you start to look at smaller and smaller pieces of real estate on the surface, both of those factors mean that you collect less light. And the only way that you can increase the sensor, the SNR for a sensor that's highly spectral sampling and good spatial resolution is to increase the four optics so you're actually collecting more light. And both of these things, uh, this increases the cost of the sensor, the development cost of the sensor as well as the uh, launch cost. Okay, so the way we addressed the problem is we, we uh, developed a radio transfer model that predicted at sensor radiances, and we defined a reference condition. This is the true condition, and it has uh, parameters that define water quality, the water depth, and then the, com the, the benthic coverage of coral or algae or uncolonized sand. We then uh, uh, computed a, a large number of test conditions, and for each cast test condition, we randomly and independently varied the, uh, the model parameters, and then asked the question, um, are, they, are they similar uh, enough that you cannot discriminate between the two based upon the noise that's imposed by SNR? And if they cannot be discriminated, then we saved the parameters um, and then went on to test a, 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 another test condition. And the, typically, the number of test conditions that we uh, tested were between 10 to the fifth and 10 to the seventh. And after all of those calculations, then, we used the uh, saved um, parameter values to compute statistics and uncertainty defi defined as the range in values for each parameter relative to the actual uh, value of the parameter. Okay, here's some results on the left-hand side of this screen. Um, and uh, as expected, uh, okay, so for each test condition, we systematically changed the SNR from 100 to 1,000 to see how the uncertainty changes. Um, and the, the, the parameters that we consider on the right-hand side there. So for each parameter, you can see that the uncertainty decreases with the increasing SNR. This was totally expected. Uh, but the values of the uncertainty are all over the place. And if you're trying to figure out, well, what's the sweet spot for SNR? What's the appropriate SNR for a coral reef sensor? It's tough to figure that out with this kind of data. But if you normalize these results to a common SNR, and we selected 1,000 for this, um, example. This is the result. And so all the data collapse into this rather common uh, between parameter uh, curve that actually represents a cost benefit curve. Uh, the cost being SNR and the benefit being decreased uncertainty. Um, and what we see here is on the left hand side for small SNRs, the incremental de uh, increase in benefit is pretty significant for each uh, increase in SNR. But as you get to larger values, certainly beyond 600 or so, it starts to flatten out, and there, you don't get much benefit for increasing SNR up in there. Um, and so you can think about this, that now we can start to make decisions about where we think uh, uh, the appropriate SNR should be. Um, so just looking at the data, we conclude that perhaps an SNR range of SNRs of between 400 and 600 uh, would be an appropriate target uh, range of SNRs for a coral reef sensor. Um, and the SBG uh, uh, target SNR of 400 is on the lower boundary of that range. It really would be nice if we could bump it up to about 500. There's still enough benefit to be um, uh, achieved there. And so that's our final result and the take home message I wanted to give you. Um, we just had a paper on this subject um, accepted in Applied Sciences. It's going to be open uh, access and would be available for download by the end of the month. So if you want to read up more about our, our methods and our conclusions, uh, check out that paper. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have one quick question. We have time for one question. All right, it's 6 o'clock. So thank you guys for staying up late Thursday night. Um, and thank you for all the speakers share your insights on Earth's observation. So dinner and beer and wine. Thank you. Thank you.